morning, everyone. I envy you. Uh, you know, you're here on a very exciting, sexy mission, technology startups. I work in a very old economy company, you know, big aeroplanes. We get engine grease in our fingernails. We breathe jet fuel. Uh, not a lot of, um, you know, dot-com type um, stuff. And of course, you know, you see how much the government is supporting uh, this ecosystem, lovely buildings, amazing programs. But when you try to start a company which is trying to compete with a government company, you get the reverse where they're trying to basically kill you. <laughs> so a uh, very, very different context. But um, for, the f uh, for some of you who may not know AirAsia X, um, we're a different airline from AirAsia, even though we start with the same brand. And the reason why it was different was because in 2007, when Tony Fernandez, the founder of AirAsia, thought there must be a way to capture an even bigger market opportunity by going beyond long haul, because the general industry expectation for low-cost carriers around the world was the formula works when you use small planes flying short distances, effectively under four hours, and those planes come back to the base every night. Going long haul was basically seen as a risky proposition, uh, a guaranteed failure. And so even AirAsia's own board of directors and shareholders turned them down, and they said, we, we can't do this. It's a foolhardy venture. And so he said, fine, if AirAsia didn't want to do it, we'll create our own separate company. We'll raise our own money. You see, the challenge is, everyone in the industry said, this cannot work. The fundamentals of the economics just don't add up. The global experts, you might have heard of airlines like Ryanair and EasyJet in Europe, Southwest, the granddaddy of all LCCs, all said long haul doesn't work. Our model works as an industry when we use small planes flying short distances. And on top of that, we were not the first to do this. All the way back in the 1970s, uh, Sir Freddie Laker, Laker Airways, he might not have been around in the 1970s, but he tried to do long haul, flying from London to New York, failed effectively got crushed by BA and American. In the 1980s, People Express also tried, I, some of you might also not have been around in the 1980s, uh, but uh, you know, they tried to do long haul, fail. Even more recently, before us, 2005, an airline from Hong Kong called Oasis Hong Kong tried to do Hong Kong London, all fail. So, everyone who's tried to do long haul LCCs without failed has failed. And so everyone's thinking, you know, if Americans fail, the Europeans fail, the Hong Kong people fail, what makes you guys think, you Malaysians, that you can pull this off? Actually, we didn't know. And, uh, and on that context, Tony basically said, okay, we'll set up a separate company, and let's try to find someone from outside the industry who's gullible enough not to know that you're not supposed to be able to do this, <laughs> to come in and, and try to, you know, pull it off. So... That's how I got into the picture. Uh, I didn't know any better. I was just someone who's flown airplanes before. That was the extent of my industry expertise. Um, the other big challenge is the moment you go long haul, and the reason why a lot of LCCs avoid going long haul is you're going against big global giants. There is no little juggle kampung space. You're immediately day one going head-to-head -head with Cathay Pacific, with British Airways, Singapore Airlines, Emirates, all with hundreds of planes in a business that's very, very scale-intensive. We started with one plane. That's all we had. Um, and, and people thought we were crazy. I mean, first of all, uh, anyone in the investing community will tell you airlines are a really crappy business to invest in. Uh, it's got a 50-year track record of destroying value. Uh, on top of that, we're trying to do a business that no one else has ever made it happen before with only one plane. So, if anything, you know, it really proved uh, Warren Buffett's famous maxim where he said, there's a certain way that can guarantee that you'll become a millionaire. Who wants to know Warren Buffett's way of becoming a millionaire? He said, "Without it's very easy. Just start with a billion dollars and then start an airline. 
you will be guaranteed to end up being a millionaire. So that was, you know, this is why this is not an easy business to uh, get in. So our little journey was about trying to figure out a completely different way of looking at the airline business, opening up the hood, thinking, tinkering with it, coming up with a different way of reconstructing an entire airline model differently based on a singular focus. And I think usually when you see big companies, there's a big opportunity when they're trying to cover multiple segments. They're going after different segments. And if you think about a lot of the global, big, successful startups that have become you know, mega successes on, on NASDAQ or NYSE, they've been relentlessly focused on one thing. And that's exactly what we did. We focused on one specific customer segment, the leisure people, the price-sensitive customers who wanted to go long haul. We challenged every little thing about how an airline should be run. Um, and we experimented. And the whole idea of AirAsiax, because we did not know the answer when we started. We just did a lot of experimentation. A lot of it failed. And I think the other big difference is the art of embracing failure. Because a lot of companies tend to be very nervous about failure, especially when you're established. They don't want to take risks. They don't want to jeopardize what they've built. Whereas when we're starting out with one plane, we had nothing to lose. So we did a lot of experimentation, a lot of failure, and learned a lot from that process. So just we're still, till today, making lots of mistakes. So I don't have a grand solution or, or grand um, uh, silver bullet to share with you, except that you know, I just wanted to share our little journey of tinkering and making mistakes and building this airline um, as we go along. Now, the one big breakthrough that we saw that apparently, in hindsight, it looks so obvious, but no one in the airline industry realized it, is this. All these big global giants, you know, airlines, the, the planes are the most expensive assets. A long-haul plane, one of our Airbus A330s, for example, cost 100 million US dollars each, right? So imagine if they got 100 planes, right? We start with one. Um, they run these expensive assets, at 50% utilization. Imagine running a data warehouse at 50% utilization. Imagine running a power plant at 50% utilization. Imagine if your website was only open 50% of the time. How crazy is that? Yet they were running their most expensive assets at only half the time. If you don't believe me, you can Google Cathay Pacific's annual report. They're one airline that also has all big white body planes. They don't have small planes. And you'll see a line in the annual report that says, Average aircraft utilization, 12 hours a day. So 12 hours a day, the plane is flying. 12 hours a day, the plane is on the ground. This is the big insight. We realized the reason why they keep their planes on the ground was because they're very focused on the business segment, the premium passengers, whose needs are very different from the price-sensitive passengers. Business customers are very time-sensitive. They really need to know what the, why they fly to get the best departure time, the best arrival time, the best connecting times. In our case, our passengers are driven by price. That's why you notice a lot of long-haul flights on traditional airlines leave late at night. You know, 11, 11 p.m., midnight, arrive in London at 6 a.m., arrive in Sydney at 6 a.m., great, because the businessman gets to start his business day. But the planes don't fly back immediately. They stay on the ground four hours, six hours, sometimes 12 hours, waiting for a more convenient time to fly. Because a businessman doesn't want to wake up at 3 a.m. to get through Heathrow by 6 a.m. to catch a 7 a.m. flight back. So planes are made to wait for the passengers. And the reason why it's very important is because while the front end of the plane, first class, business class, only represents on average about 18% of seats on these airlines' fleet, they generate almost 40% of revenues and almost 60% of profits for these airlines. That's why they're taking care of those customers. For those of you who are, like me, flying in economy, we are an afterthought. You know, we're like, okay, la, rounding error. <laughs> right? It's just space. Fill up, fill up, fill up, fill up. Don't care. Right? But they're very focused on designing the whole airline schedules to meet the requirements of that valuable customer. So by simply saying, hang on a second, if we're not focused on that, we're focusing on this one segment, the price-sensitive segment, can we design a different airline schedule? Today, 
we run the world's highest aircraft utilization rate, about 17 hours a day. And all we do is just optimize on the use of the plane. Wherever we go, a good example, right? Uh, we fly to Sydney late at night. Malaysia Airlines flies to Sydney late at night. We both get there early in the morning. In our case, as with everywhere else we fly, within 75 minutes, the plane flies back. Even if it means you've got to get up at 4 a.m. to rush to the airport to catch one of our flights, you do it because it's a, it's a savings on, on the ticket. But Malaysia Airlines keeps that plane in Sydney for about four to six, five hours, depending on daylight savings, arriving or departing later after lunch, because by the time they get back into KL at night, perfect connecting times for the flights to Europe. So they're really after a lot of these Australians who are going on to Europe or the Brits who are going on to uh, Australia. So they want the seamless, you know, 60-minute transit at KL. You, you know, you've got these passengers arriving at gate 37, you walk over to gate 34, catch your flight, your, your bag's already transferred for you. Perfect solution. But the net result is the plane is on the ground waiting, idle. You know, just think about it. A flight to London, right? even if you go there very, very fast, it's going to take you 12 hours. And even if you could turn around that plane in one hour, you fly back, that round trip is now at least 25 hours, right? But airlines also decide because businessmen memorize airline schedules. You know, SQ002, departing at 11.45. You know, they, they take it so often, they need the reliability of the schedule. But to have the airline fly at the same time every day, you're going to need more than one plane, right? That, that one aspect alone kills utilization. Whereas in our case, for example, you know, flight to Hangzhou, Monday leaves in the morning, Tuesday leaves in the afternoon, because we're trying to maximize the use of the time. And our belief is that people are choosing to fly with us first because of price, not because of that's the best time to fly. If it just so happens to be a good time, great. Sometimes a good, sometimes not good. People decide based on price. And so doing that alone basically means in one year, we buy the same brand new plane as Singapore or Cathay, flying 17 hours a day as opposed to 12 to 13 hours a day means we get about 35% more flights in a year. And every flight, every flight has about 30% more seats because we don't use up a lot of the real estate for first class, business class, big galleys. We can put more seats. Simple math even if the price per seat is 50% lower, in one year, you get the same revenue for the same cost of the brand new plane. That was it. That was what resulted in um, a huge unit cost difference. This is the way an airline measures unit cost. Your total operating cost divided by all the seats times all the kilometers that you fly. And you can see on the uh, left-hand side, AirAsia X today is the world's lowest unit cost airline operator at about 3.7 cents per seat per kilometer. Every kilometer that you fly costs 3.7 US cents to fly you one kilometer, so depending on your distance, right? Whereas you can look at Emirates, 8.2, Cathay Pacific, 9.7, Lufthansa, 14 plus European labor costs. Um, so to be able to create that big cost advantage despite having only one plane when we started now, 20 planes, when these guys all have hundreds of planes, comes from really rethinking the model, turning it upside down and saying, hey, you know, we can get a lot more units by focusing on the price-sensitive customer as opposed to the, um, uh, you know, the premium passengers. But businesses, big, you'll see a lot of big businesses, whether it's in telecommunications, retail, um, and you know, they try to, to go after so many different segments, inevitably, you've got to make trade-offs and constraints, as opposed to being singularly focused on one segment and meeting the needs of that segment very clearly and focused. And that's how this big breakthrough came about. And there are a lot of other things that go with it. I'll just give you one more example. Um, food and beverage. Would you believe it if I told you how we serve food and beverage explains 100 US dollars cost difference versus how Singapore Cafe serves food and beverage. You think, come on, Lazran, food doesn't cost that much, right? But think about this. First, in our case, as you know, I mean, if you choose to eat, you pay for it. Now, a lot of our flights are late night. Most people would have uh, eaten at home or at the airport. They get on the plane, they want to sleep. Um, and so we don't actually cover the cost of the meal because that's paid for the passenger. 
But if you fly Singapore, everybody gets a meal. You think it's free, but it's actually embedded in your price ticket. And if you think you want to sleep when you get on the plane at midnight, they're going to insist on waking you up and putting the tray and, and insist on uh, feeding you. Um, and then, right, have you noticed with, when you fly with us, we ask you at the time that you book, what meal do you want? Right? whether you want the nasi lama or the uh, roast beef or the vegetarian dish, etc., because we want to know how much inventory to stock up. These airlines, they don't ask you before, they ask you on board. Right? They come to you and ask you, would you like the chicken or the fish? You pause and you think, can I have the fish, please? Oh, sorry, we ran out of fish, we only have chicken. Well, why'd you ask me in the first place? <laughs> um, no, that's not true. Because they're premium carriers, they tend to have about 15 to 20% extra food to avoid disappointing customer's choice. That adds to wastage. All this uh, main food, it doesn't last the next flight. It's got to be thrown out. So when you have more stock, that adds to your overall cost. And third, have you noticed why every airline seems to decide that a meal must come with a tray, with a bun, with a salad, that funny-looking pink dessert that you play with and you don't really eat? All of that adds to cost, and it's not just the material cost, there's a lot of packaging cost that goes with it. Even Cathay Pacific that makes millions of meals every year, a lot of that is still hand-assembled into the trays, into the carts, and cuts up into the plane. So there's a lot of cost that go up with it. Now think about the next part, think about how a meal is served. If you fly these carriers, right? I mean, first they come to you with a hot towel, Although nowadays, it's like this damp piece of paper that they give you, right? And then they come back again to collect that hot towel or, or the used towel or, or, or towelette. Uh, and then they come again and give you peanuts and drinks. Fantastic. And then they come again to collect the empty cup and, and the trash. And then they come again finally now with the cart. And you, you know, you're salivating and you, know, you make your choice and they give, arrange it neatly one by one. And if you're asleep, they're still going to insist on bringing your chair forward, putting your meal down and putting, you know, putting the food in front of you one by one by one. And then after serving everyone, they come back again right, to top up your drinks. Right? Would you like some juice or wine? Uh, and then you come back again for coffee or tea. And then you come back again. I mean, this is what happens, right? Right? And then they, when you're done, they daintily take the tray and arrange it back into the cart and go off. What that means, as opposed to, of course, you know, the AirAsia, AirAsia X way of serving food, right? I mean, cart goes, you've pre-ordered your meal, great, here's your nasi lemak, would you like a Coke with that? Thank you very much. When you're done, we come back again with this black uh, garbage bag and everything goes thrown in, Poof, we can serve everyone. What that means is, same plane, Singapore Airlines, Airbus A330-300 has 285 seats. AirAsia X, Airbus A330-300, 377 seats. Singapore Airlines, 11 flight attendants. AirAsia X, 9 flight attendants. All right. For the guys of you who are quick with math, 285 divided by 11, compare that to 377 divided by 9. What's the answer? Okay, it's almost a 60% productivity difference. You think about the cost of flight attendants, and it's not just the direct cost of the salaries, the flying allowances, the training that goes into it, the, the ground transportation, the hotel rooms. And of course, in Singapore Airlines, they each get a hotel room to themselves in a five-star hotel. Our flight attendants share two people to a room in a three-star hotel. Right? That's one in thing in common we have with Cheryl's startup. We don't pay well. Um, and, uh, you know, when you add the cost of the meals, the wastage, all the extra packaging, all the extra cost of the direct and indirect cost of the flight attendance, 100 US dollars per passenger cost difference. By just simply thinking differently, as opposed to every airline saying, this is the way food is served. Right? Everybody was just doing it things one way. We just created a different way of doing it. I'm going to skip this part. Now that I've told you um, our secret, you can now go out and start your own long-haul LCC. Right? All you need is just one plane. All you need is to look at our website and know, ah, okay, this is how you put 377 seats 
because our layout is on the website, so you can actually copy how we put the seats in. You can look at our airline flight schedules to know this is how they get 17 hours a day, as opposed to Cathay doing 12 hours a day. You can now go out and start your own long-haul LCC. I've given you the whole, it's, you know, there's no IP in this business. You can go around. Off. In fact, that's exactly what the Singaporeans did. You know, when we first started, uh, Mr. Chu, the former CEO of Singapore Airlines, he went on public, on record, to say this long-haul LCC model is rubbish, we're SIA, we know that long-haul passengers must want their meals, must want their in-flight entertainment, if you don't give that, they won't fly. We know better, we're SIA. Five years on, apparently being good Singaporeans, they diligently took notes, flew on us, and then eventually launched their own version, changed it from red to yellow, and poof, off they go because there's no trade secret. So the key thing, therefore, is how do you keep changing and evolving the model? Because as long as the Singaporeans are behind you doing good benchmarking, competitive analysis, uh, you know, they're always going to be behind you because they're benchmarking, right? As opposed to coming up with what's next, what's next, what's new. And that's exactly what we did. That's the only way to survive because we don't have the scale and the might and the capital of SIA or Cathay, we only have our wits. We only have the ability to be nimble and move, right, as opposed to, you know, big aircraft carrier type organizations. So we constantly try to come up with what's the next new thing. One of them is this. We began the first low-cost carrier in the world to have flatbed business class quality seats. And everybody thought, Azran, you've lost the plot. You've just added cost, you've added complexity, you've gone against the model. This is not what Southwest does. This is not what Ryanair and EasyJet, this is not even what Air Asia does. So why are you doing this? This adds a lot of cost. But then we realized, long haul, remember Singapore Airlines, Cathay, they make a lot of their profits here. Right? So any of you who you know, pay their money to fly business class, you know, it's a huge amount of their profits. And we realized the actual cost of the seat is not much, right? And they tried to justify these big high prices by, you know, competing on lounges. Airlines spend millions of dollars on lounges trying to do out each other. You know, they, they have the best food on board with champagne and caviar and lobster, etc. You know, and if you don't drink the champagne, you're, you're subsidizing the drunks who do. Um, and frankly, it's a late night flight anyway, right? I mean, you get, you get on the plane, you want to sleep. And, and they're trying to stuff with you all, all the food just to justify the high prices. So we said, look, let's come up with a product. Same quality seat with a nice big pillow, a nice comfortable duvet for the fraction of the price of an economy class. Because we realize there's some people who normally don't fly LCCs, uncool. But if we gave them a flatbed business class seat for the price of an economy, ticket on their favorite airline, maybe those Chris Fly points don't look that attractive after all, right? Um, in fact, you know, before us, a certain, uh, you know, full service carrier, even when you fly business class, gave you this very thin purple blanket. You know, now that we started using duvets, uh, they've had to upgrade and change the game. Um, so, the other key thing for us was we realized if we had an all-economy configuration, the last 10% of space only gets filled up about six months in a year because leisure holiday makers are seasonal. January, February, peak. August, summer month, peak. December, super peak. But in you know, March, April, uh, May, September, October, you, you, you can barely sell 90% and you're very good, so you've got 10% that's empty. If we took out the seats on the last 10% and put them on these business class seats, we would be making revenue every day of the year. And so we worked out this big Monte Carlo simulation model, which basically showed us that uh, you know, we could earn 16% more revenue in a year if we had these seats instead of uh, an all-economy configuration. So this is an example of thinking differently. Just because every other airline says business class must include lounges and fancy food and wine, doesn't mean that's the way you, you must do it. Still today, I mean, you think about it, that's how every other airline does it. For the rest of you who don't fly business class, you fly economy, right, long haul, on a long haul flight, you know, how, you know how sometimes you wish nobody comes and sits next to you so you got all three seats in a row to yourself? You pray, right? And of course, 
Murphy's Law, someone's going to come and sit, parks himself right next to you, but you know the game, right? The row maybe right next to you is all empty. So the moment the seatbelt sign goes off, chok, claim territory, sweater, book, you know, this is mine, this is mine. That's the power of observation. You don't need to do market research or anything. If you observe, I mean, these are things that people, you know, people's behaviors when they fly. So we realize, let's come up with a new model. And uh, so we have a product called an empty seat option. What that basically means is we sell you a chance, not a guarantee, to get all three seats in a row to yourself. So, you know, and it's dynamically priced because we're AirAsia, you know, 30 ringgit, 40 ringgit, 50 ringgit, 70 ringgit, depending on the demand for that particular flight, you get a chance. You, get, you come to check in. If on that day we haven't sold every single seat on the plane, we can give you three seats in a row, boom, we keep your 50 ringgit. But if we've sold all the seats, we can't give it to you, we refund you back the 50 ringgit. Simple idea, a lot of people love it because for a small amount, they get a, a good chance of, of getting um, three seats in a row. And we sort of try to calculate to make sure that the success rate is at least 50%. Because if the success rate is 10%, nobody's going to try it out, right? Um, and it's also a way for us to earn that extra money on seats that would have otherwise been empty, right? So an empty product suddenly becomes a way of generating revenue and creating value for customers by doing it differently. Another option. You know how, in, in our case, um, for people who are very fussy about where they sit, um, you know, for a fee, because <laughs> it's AirAsia, you, you get to choose where you sit. Right? Now, even if you don't want to pay, you'll still get an assigned seat. Right? Now, interestingly, in the old days, AirAsia used to have a free seating model. When we started in 2007, we thought, ooh, long haul with 300 people, we're going to have a big stampede. We introduced assigned seating because we knew some people, small bladder, really want an aisle seat. Some people, first time flying, want to go and see on the window seat. Some people, six people in the family, they want to sit together, but make sure the mother-in-law sits at the back. So they pick, <laughs> they want to choose exactly where they sit on the plane. And when we introduced that in 2007, it wasn't until 18 months later that AirAsia realized, it's not a bad idea, let's do it too. So they eventually followed. Um, AirAsia X. So as we're sitting down thinking, how do we keep encouraging more people to want to choose where to sit? So we came up with the idea of saying the first row of our economy seats, no kids under 12. Right? So no chance of you being right next to a screaming toddler. If you like that, right, you're more likely to want to pick a seat. Right? So, and it actually doesn't cost any, there's no additional cost to do that. Right? We just zone it. So if, you, if you're traveling with children, you sit at the back section. Um, but if you're sitting in front, no kids under 12. Now, CNN wrote about this, New York Times wrote about this, and you know, being Americans, you thought, are you discriminating against families with kids? You know, Americans and their old discrimination, discrimination. <laughs> Actually, it turns out, families with kids love the idea because they're sitting at the back. But now, when the kids you know, throw a tantrum, and the guy next to them gives them the evil eye, they can say, yeah, don't complain. You don't like it, you should have sat in the quiet zone. <laughs> so everyone's happy, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, since we say, oh, let's call it quiet zone, let's, you know, you know, you see on these planes, have mood lighting, you know, create a bit of an ambiance, nice, like, spa type environments. So we said, you know, let's, you know, told my engineering team, let's go out there and look at all these lighting solutions. You have to go to aircraft lighting specialists. Uh, you know, all these latest LED technologies, you can you know, have pink, blue, purple, green, time it with sunrise, time it with sunset, perfect stuff. Except, one quote, $82,000 per aircraft. Another quote, $115,000 per aircraft. Another quote, $92,000 per aircraft. That's a lot of money. And one thing you know about us is we're cheap. Now I'm thinking like, how many extra seats, assigned seats do we have to sell just to make up the cost of having these lights? It's not tough. But then, the engineering boys came, boss, don't worry. We have another solution. We go to Kapong. <laughs> we get plastic wrapping paper. Blue color, right? And we just wrap the fluorescent lights. For 10 ringgit, Ta-da!
Now, I gave this presentation in Singapore once, and apparently there was a Singapore Airlines engineer. He stood up and said, is that certificated? Is that safe? <laughs> because any modification you have to do in an airline, you have to get it certificated. And I'm pleased to tell you, right, day one, anything that we change, even if you want to put a little sticker on a plane, you have to get it certificated. And in this case, there were two key tests. The first was a burn test. Right? You want to make sure that the heat from the fluorescent light bulb doesn't you know, spark a, a flame on, on that. And so we had to demonstrate to pass the, the burn test. The second is a lumens test. Because in an emergency, I can't have my cabin crew take up the fluorescent light bulb, unwrap the plastic, and put it back. So we need to have enough lighting that uh, people can, can see during the emergency. That's why you see some, not all light bulbs are blue. Some are still white because we needed enough just to pass the luminosity that's required uh, on the lumens machine. So it is fully certificated at 10 ringgit instead of 82,000 $82, US dollars per aircraft. Different way of doing things. But the last point I just wanted to wrap up and uh, is, you know, these are some of the good ideas that you see, but there's also been a lot of royal mistakes that we've made. Not everything turns out well. But the key thing is the philosophy of, you know, just do 10 things. You know, if you get six out of 10 right, that's a good day, right? As long as you know, okay, those four things went wrong, just move, change, pivot, move on to the next thing. It's surprising how a lot of big organizations are so fixated on mistakes, right? Oh, something happened. Whose fault is it? Is it engineering? Is it, you know, flight attendant's fault? Is it uh, operations? And so when, when there's a lot of blame going around, people tend to be hesitant to do something new because they know, hey, you know, something goes wrong, we get blamed. Something goes right, the boss takes the credit. So why, why stick your neck out and do anything new when it's better to be safe and just keep things status quo? That's why all the other big global carriers haven't changed their model in decades because it's not safe to do so. Whereas in our case, you embrace mistakes. Many examples, but... Um, you know, we, were, we thought we'd be cool in the spirit of trying to be innovative, to be the first LCC in the world to have a full digital touchscreen in-flight entertainment system on every seat. So for those of you who flew us in 2008, 2009, you would have known that, you know, we had all these seats. And it had some very interesting features. It had instant messaging. You know, you're sitting on 13F and you kind of like the person on 16D. Hi, 16D, nice to meet you. <laughs> you could flirt on board. And it was, that part was popular. And we thought, you know, you can order meals, right? Instead of waiting for the flight attendant to come to you, you can key in. I want uh, a Coke, I want a bag of chips, I want a sandwich. Boop, 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 swipe your card, boom, order goes. Problem was, when it came to serving, it was chaos. Because the moment you order, you want it now, right? But the poor flight attendants, you know, 13D wants a Coke, ding, bring it to 13D. And then, boom, 27G wants another sandwich, you know? There's just no flow to it. And, and it just drove the flight attendants mad and drove the passengers mad when they had to wait. So that part wasn't good. Then we realized, boy, movies, right? Hollywood charges an astronomical rate for licensing fees, and Hollywood doesn't trust you to declare how many people watch movies. So they charge you a royalty fee for every title times every screen. That's a lot of money, right? So if we, if, if we try to charge... Uh, Ten dollars uh, for for you know the whole in-flight entertainment. You can barely get thirty percent of people watching, right? Especially on, on late-night flights. You know people don't want to watch movies. They they fall asleep or they just watch the plane going on the screen <laughs> for twelve hours because um, they don't want to pay. Um, and so we realized, boy, this is not a viable proposition. And we had to scrap this and the seats. There's some problems with the seats, but I'll save that for another day. All in, it was a 60 million ringgit write-off, right? Still have my job, right? It didn't, didn't lose my job because the spirit was do something, right idea, but just because it doesn't come out right doesn't mean the idea itself wasn't a, a bold idea that we shouldn't have done, right? So creating a culture where mistakes are you know, in, in doing something innovative, I tolerate it. We don't tolerate people doing the same thing, same mistakes over and over again. But when you try something new, you're not going to get punished if it doesn't quite work out because the logic w was right. And interestingly, sometimes you can learn and get advantages from the mistakes. 
So by scrapping all these in-flight entertainment screens, when we measure our planes, we realize our planes became two tons lighter. So all these other carriers that have these in-flight and, and in entertainment systems are flying with two extra tons of weight. Because what you don't see in this picture are kilometers of wires and cables connecting power and content from the central server, power systems to every single seat, kilometers under the floor. We could try lifting that up. And so weight means extra fuel being burned. So we now have a fuel advantage over other carriers that have these in-flight entertainment systems. And we didn't know that, but now we learn. And now we've moved on from this to having portable Samsung Galaxy tablets for rent. Because we know, okay, daytime flight to Australia, you only need 60 units out of the 377 seats because demand says roughly about that. Nighttime flight, probably only 20 units. Flights to China, don't bother, they won't pay. <laughs> so, you know, so we know, okay, the, the royalty fees are linked to content, and this one we know there's a high likelihood that all going to be, the, the screens are going to be taken up, there's no additional weight. And today, the, the, the business model of uh, renting portable Samsung Galaxy tablets is a profit-making uh, stream as opposed to when we had it and every seat losing a ton of money every flight. So you've got to sometimes evolve and learn from mistakes. And you won't, we wouldn't have figured this out if we didn't try it and learn and evolve. And that's basically the little story of AeroJX, constantly learning, constantly making mistakes, and constantly trying to figure out what's next, what's next, what's next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Azran. Okay, we open the floor up for uh, question and answers. We have 10 minutes, so please raise your hand. We will bring a microphone over to you. Okay, no microphone, so please speak louder when you give your questions to Azran. First question, please. Question. Warren, okay. What kind of people do we recruit in AirAsia X? Um, to be fair, uh, there are two types of people. We, we've gone from being a startup to now having 2,500 employees. But 85% of our employees are frontline specialists, pilots, flight attendants, uh, engineers, technicians, uh, ground operations staff. And, and there, you know, it's more specific for functional skills, right? And you have to go through an academy, get trained to do a particular job. Um, so that's a very unique and focused uh, recruitment channel. Uh, but for the 15% of people, you know, I think mostly it's trying to find people who, first of all, have a real passion for travel. Because if, if, you just, if you're just looking for a job and you're not interested in what we do, you're not going to last long. Right? So I think generally people who join us love travel, love what we're trying to do. Secondly, I think it's people who are you know, just curious and, you know, eager to try different things, uh, you know, who have demonstrated a track record of trying different things in whatever roles they have, as opposed to people who are coming in who say, oh, this is the way I think things should be done. Um, so I think that's basically, I think, the profile that would look for, I think, people who've got the energy, who've got the passion for travel. Hey, sir. Good. Uh, I was just wondering, I, I don't know whether this would be a sensitive question for you, but um, what do you think about MAS right now? In terms of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Naughty, Zarif. I know that MAS is in deep trouble, <laughs> right? But uh, what's your thoughts on that? Ah, <sighs> okay. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, no holes barred. Um, let me try to generalize the structural issue. Um, in any industry, not in the airline industry, my view is the only two successful business models are the ones where you're either focusing on price as your proposition, and if you're gonna focus on price as your proposition, you better have the lowest cost structure to be able to sustainably use price as your proposition. Or, you offer a very premium product that has the best products and service quality and you command a premium on that. The problem are guys who are stuck in the middle. You think about it, cars, right? You either have a Mercedes-Benz or you have a Kia, 
right? Uh, hotels, Ritz-Carlton, Four Seasons, or Tune Hotel to the Inn. Uh, fashion, right? From Chanel, Ferragamo to H&M, Zara, Uniqlo. The problems are in industries where you've got people stuck in the middle who don't have the same kind of product or service quality to command the premium to go and say, we've got the same brand new plane and seats as an Etihad or Emirates or Singapore Airlines does. But at the same time, if your cost structure is double that of price and you try to compete on price, that's a recipe for disaster. So ultimately, they've got to choose. If you want to choose to compete on price, you've got to be prepared to slash 60% of your cost. Or if you're not prepared to do so, you've got to be prepared to have the best product and service quality. But you cannot stay in the middle. Because every time you stay in the middle, you're going to get whacked on both ends. You're going to get squeezed and you have just no margin, no room to believe, no maneuverability. So fundamentally, what they really need to do is choose. Don't get stuck in the middle. Another question from the floor? And this is... So the question is how to create a, an innovative culture that is profitable, sustainable, and what's the different. different? Different. Sure. The short answer is I don't know <laughs> because we haven't been consistently profitable. We're still young. We haven't been truly sustainable. And, uh, but what we at least believe and what we're trying to do is... Uh, creating a culture for me where information has to flow both ways. In a lot of organizations, it's very hierarchical. There's a top-down focus, right? Instructions come from the top. There's a lot of real willingness to step up and uh, let ideas come. See, some people, for example, think, okay, if we have an open space office, if I have an open door policy and I'll tell my staff, you know, if you've got issues, you've got problems, you've got ideas, just come to me. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because people are not going to voluntary, voluntarily come to you with issues and ideas. You've got to create as leaders uh, the opportunities to go out and reach out and engage with people. Don't expect people to come to you. That's one of the things we've learned. So, uh, for example, when we were a startup, it was easy because everyone's in a small room and you know about all the issues. But as you start getting bigger and bigger, people in different locations, it gets harder. And so we've had to institute, for example, monthly dialogues, right? Where every month I have a session with flight attendants, every month I have a session with pilots, every month I have a session with engineers. And in those sessions, when you first start, you can say, hey, okay, let me tell you about what's going on with the company and anyone's got any issues. Chances are, the first few meetings, most people are going to keep quiet, right? Because they don't know, am I allowed to speak? And if I, you know, if I say something wrong, you know, will my manager start whacking me for raising this with the CEO? But it all, eventually, someone just starts with a small thing. But if you prove that those who speak get hurt and action gets taken and their lives and their jobs become easier, people start to say, hey, actually, uh, you have an issue, next time you bring it to the dialogue, we get something done, right? So for example, um, we had one session where uh, the flight attendants were saying, you know, sometimes um, we arrive and we've got a, a person uh, in a wheelchair or needs a wheelchair, but the ground operations people were late in bringing the wheelchair over. And so we've got to wait 30, 40 minutes. The, the passengers really irate and screaming and, and we don't, you know, we're stuck because we can't go home until all the passengers leave. Right? And of course, the ground operations people are saying, look, you know, sometimes this flight's delayed, we've got to move here, move there, and, and we can't attend to every single flight uh, at the same time. And through that dialogue, we say, hmm, how about since at every aircraft, there is an engineering van because the engineers come and you know, they immediately work on, on uh, checking the planes. What if we had a spare foldable wheelchair that's kept in the engineering van? So that in the instance, if the ground operations people come with a, a wheelchair late, just you, flight attendant, walk down to the engine van, get the wheelchair, and just 
you know, take the person. At least that problem is solved, you can move on, right? And we did that. That was on a Friday. On Monday, we instituted it, right? And so someone else said, hey, actually, next time around, you've got small ideas. You address it, you address it, you address it. You have got to build the credibility with your team. And when you can get that two-way dialogue, that's where issues come up, that's where we get feedback, that's where we solve it. But it's very important to somehow as leaders find, sort of create the culture for people to be willing to speak up. And you've got to earn your credibility with your staff. You cannot say, you know, you must come to me with problems. It just doesn't work. People are naturally concerned, right, about speaking up. So you've got to create and win over their trust one day at a time. Hey, hi, Zaf. Uh, my name is Zafu. Um, I have a question. So you said that you experimented, you started one play, and you had your breakthrough moment when you found a segment. I'm just wondering, how many experiments did you run? How many failures did you get? Uh, and, and how long did it take to get your breakthrough? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think when we first started, we already had the main hypothesis of the cost structure point on flying more hours and having more seats. Um, so that part allowed us to start immediately. With the, so that first plane was able to generate that cost advantage. Um, so it wasn't like we experimented and figured out that insight first. Um, but while we got that basic right, we knew that alone was not sufficient. We had to constantly then keep finding ways of how do we generate more value, more revenue, because if all you're reliant on is only the lowest price, at some point, someone else is going to come in with a bigger balance sheet and can easily drown you out. So that's why we had to always start to find new ways of adding value. And a lot of that just came from day one, observing customers, day one, uh, getting a lot of feedback on Facebook, on Twitter from, from customers to get different ideas. Oh, where should we fly? Uh, what should we do? Oh, here's a problem. Here's a complaint. How do we keep tweaking it? And some of the things worked, some of the things didn't work. So that part was the one that was evolutionary. But when we first started, the core hypothesis already was fly 17 hours a day. Next question, please. Yeah, sure. Hey. Okay, uh, good point. So we, we don't, it's not structured. It's not like these are the experiments we're going to do. Every little part of the business was, you know, had someone thinking, is, you know, it's not like as the leader, you are the one that's trying to decide what problems are we going to solve and who should be the one solving it, right? But if you share a common mission, then everyone starts to find the new problems that they want to solve and experiment with. So we, the way we did it was we described our entire business so that everybody could understand at every level four simple ways. One, two, three, four. Right? We said, number one, we want to be a $1 billion company in five years right? every, and celebrate every revenue milestone. We celebrated our first million, first 10 million, first 100 million ringgit, then first 100 million US, then first 1 billion ringgit, then first 1 billion US. So everybody knew, okay, if, if you can find a new way of generating $1 of revenue, great. Two, two US cents per seat kilometer. We have to be the world's lowest unit cost operator. And the good thing about the airline industry measuring in cost, in cents, is every cent counts. So people are constantly trying to find ways of uh, saving every little cent. Three, three out of four hours, the plane must be in the air, right? Four. Four out of every five seats must be filled and must be filled with happy customers. If you're working towards those four things, you're doing something right. If you're not, don't waste our time. And so that means even a finance clerk, right, who's just processing payments, can come out and say, hey, boss, huh? instead of, I just noticed some of our vendors, they accept credit cards for payments. So instead of just doing normal bank transfer, where you give a bank uh, uh, instruction and you have to pay a small fee to the bank, what if we pay by credit card? We collect points. And those points we can use when we need to travel to a place that we don't fly to today, uh, so we redeem the miles. So we reduce our own cash expenditure. That's a finance clerk. 
I didn't define that as a problem, but because they know one, two, three, four, and their little job, they can see, hey, this contributes to two, why don't I propose this? And it comes back to the point about if you've got a culture where people are putting out their hand and say, hey, I'm going to solve this. Right? Like an, another thing at, at this monthly dialogue, one of the flight attendants is saying, hey, you know, we used to have this policy where, let's say on a flight to Australia, we would accept ringgit, we would accept Australian dollars, we would accept US dollars. Increasingly, we found quite a lot of Thais and Indonesians on our flights to Australia. So they're flying with us. They don't have Australian dollar currencies. They don't have ringgit, and they're hungry. They want to buy. So our policy was basically saying, I've got food, but I'm not going to sell you because I don't accept your currency. How dumb is that? Right? And so the flight attendants came out and said, you know, boss, we're just missing out on the sales. I'm losing commissions, and I've got pissed off customers. How difficult is it to accept multiple currencies? And we looked around and said, yeah, because AirAsia's got flights to Thailand and Indonesia. We know what those exchange rates are. Why can't we just give an exchange rate sheet? And of course, the finance people, oh, yeah, okay, okay, fine. But we need one month to reprint the forms. And we say, really? Uh, why not, for the time being, in that one month period, we just handwrite it? So, again, that Monday morning, it was implemented. Right? That was an experiment I was looking for. It was an issue that someone had, an opportunity that he said, I'm missing sales. I could do a much better job if we solved this. And uh, when finance threw another constraint, they went back and said, why can't we just handwrite it? So it's the important thing is creating the culture where, where people are prepared to speak up. Right? And, and just to illustrate, I mean, just a few weeks ago, I had a, a fresh graduate who was assigned by her manager because I said, hey, this is something new that's happening in, in the retail space. You know, I, I send them this document. Can you read it and have one of your analysts summarize it for me? So his manager said, hey, Azran, you know, read this 30-page report and, and do a simple PowerPoint presentation uh, uh, to get ready to present to Azran. So this fresh graduate read this PowerPoint presentation and then immediately, in one hour, walked up to me and came up to me and said, Azran, my boss said I have to do this PowerPoint presentation, but really, if, I give you five, if you give me five minutes of your time, I can explain it in five minutes, no need PowerPoint presentation. That's the culture you want. Because it's not about, you know, just because my boss says this must be the way to do it. And for a fresh graduate who's prepared to walk up to the CEO to say, just five minutes and saves me third, you know, uh, two hours to prepare this PowerPoint presentation, saves you how much longer to read it, right? Instead, I can just tell it to you what you need to know in five minutes. That's the difference in culture that a lot of people don't have. So that's your goal of creating the culture that you want. Right? And it's the small things, it's the victories. When you allow that to happen, when you celebrate that, that's when you know, it catches on. Right? So that's, that's how you create that experimentation. Thank you. Okay, one final question. Yeah. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, not the first time I'm asked, and, and I, I don't have a very strong answer for you. Um, but what I would say is, I think I was incredibly fortunate to grow up in an environment where my parents allowed me to speak. You know, as a four-year-old, right, they would have guests come over, and I would be asked to come up and tell these guests what I was doing or what I was painting or what I was drawing or what I was reading. Uh, and that made a lot of difference, first of all, in terms of self-confidence as opposed to, hey, keep quiet and don't bother the adults. And secondly, uh, the other thing my parents did was give me the space to experiment and try different things, right? Uh, let's say you watch and you're like, ooh, I want to take guitar lessons. That sounds cool, right? All right, go for it. And uh, three months later, I don't want a boring guitar get collecting dust. I don't get yelled at, right? Um, I think that upbringing helped me to be willing to try new things. And that's kind of how I got into Ultimate Frisbee. I got into Stanford. I used to play field hockey in, in Malaysia. I got there and asked, hey, guys, where's the field hockey team? And they looked at me and go, dude, 
Only women play field hockey, men play ice hockey. <laughs> but, oh, tropical boy, can't ice skate. So, found a different sport. And I didn't want to just learn how to throw a frisbee, I want to play on the university team, I want to compete in the national championships. Um, so I think that part wired me, you know, sort of the whole, you know, nothing is impossible, just try it, give it a shot, and give it 110%. So it wasn't so much as role models per se, but parents who helped me create the space that allowed me to experiment. And hopefully I'm, you know, bringing this culture of experimentation for, um, you know, carrying on throughout the whole career. Thank you. Big round of applause for our guest. <laughs>